Hello, welcome back. So today we're going to discuss a large and important class of kernels called uh, Mercer kernels. The Mercer kernels are important for several reasons. Um, one of them is that uh, historically they were the first positive definite kernels studied already at the beginning of the 20th century by Mercer, who in a famous paper in 1905 demonstrated that Kernel, so Mercer kernels that I will define in a second, um, which are positive definite kernels, can be written as inner products. So remember from the first lecture of this course, we, we proved that any positive definite kernel is an inner product. And for that, we needed to introduce the concept of reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which is a concept that was invented by Aaron Jan and, and colleagues around 40 years after this first work of Mercer. Right, so Mercer has a direct proof that a subset of positive definite kernels, the so-called Mercer kernels, can be written as inner products. And this is what we will discuss today. Uh, the second important reason why we will discuss them is that using uh, the approach of Mercer to prove that a kernel uh, is an inner product uh, is quite useful in order to study the theory of uh, the statistical learning with kernels, and in particular, it's useful to study the approximation properties when you have an RKHS uh, that approximates a space of functions. We will see um, a bit later how they can be used uh, to control how fast uh, the, 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 the functions in a ball of the RKHS approximate any function. And this is useful to establish learning bounds uh, in learning theory. All right, so without further ado, let me define formally what is a Mercer kernel. So it's just a subset of positive definite kernels. So it's a positive definite kernel, uh, which has two constraints. The first one is that it's defined on a space, which is not any space. So capital X here is a space of data. Uh, and to be a Mercer kernel, we need the space X to be a compact metric space. To be simpler, and this is what was done in the Mercer paper in 1905, we will just focus on a closed bounded subset of RD. So think of X as, for example, the closed interval 0, 1, or 0, 1 square if you in R2. The second property that we need uh, to, to have in order to talk of a Mercer kernel is that the function K, so the kernel, should be a continuous function, all right? Uh, not, you know, there, there are plenty of positive definite kernels which are not continuous, but to be a Mercer kernel, you need to be a continuous function over a compact metric space. And if, this, if these two conditions are fulfilled, then uh, we talk of Mercer kernel, and we will see that for these kernels, we can directly prove that they can be written as inner product, in the sense that k of x, y can be written as the inner product between psi of x and psi of y for some mapping psi which will be different from the RKHS, right? Of course, we can also talk of the RKHS of these kernels, but here we'll see something specific that exists for Mercer kernels. And, and so the idea of, uh, that we will develop is in fact uh, similar to what we did when the space X is finite. If you remember at the very beginning of the course, we said that if the space X is finite, then it's easy to show that a positive definite function over a finite space can be written as an inner product, because if x is finite, we can, if you remember, we could uh, completely define the function k by a matrix, which tells you what is the value of k of x, y for any x and any y. So it was, it was a square matrix that defined the kernel function. And if k is positive definite, it meant that this matrix is symmetric and, and positive semi-definite. And then we, for such matrices, we can use a generic theorem that tells us that such matrices can be diagonalized with non-negative eigenvalues. Therefore, they can be written as something like phi times phi transpose. And this directly gives us the property that phi of x can be written as phi, uh, sorry, k of x, y can be written as phi of x times phi of x, y. Right, well, the idea with Mercer kernels is that we can do the same uh, the same thing, meaning we can diagonalize a matrix, except that here the space X is not necessarily fi finite. Think of the interval 0, 1, the closed interval 0, 1. So we need to extend a bit the concept of matrices to matrices of infinite size, right? Instead of having, let's say, a thousand or a million points, now we have infinite number of points in the closed interval. 
But so the concept of a matrix over a continuous space exists. It's called a linear operator. So we will basically show that using the same technique as for finite spaces, we can define a linear operator that will be the equivalent of the kernel matrix over all the points. And we will show that basically this operator is like the matrices uh, in the sense that it's symmetric, that it's uh, positive semi-definite. And then we will use a theorem called the spectral theorem, which is the equivalent for operators to the theorem of diagonalizing symmetric matrices. Right, so the spectral theorem will allow us to diagonalize the operator and therefore to write the kernel function uh, as a sum. So it will be an infinite sum, meaning there will be some limit at some point, but as a sum of lambda k times psi k of, psi k of x, psi k of t for k of x t. Uh, and this will allow us to prove that k uh, of x t can be written as some inner product. Okay, so the, the, the inner product we have here is not the RKHS in a product. It's really like the inner product we had for uh, the case where the, the space X was finite and we just said that the matrix of kernel can be diagonalized. Here we diagonalize the operator. Of course, now we will explain that in detail. We'll uh, go through all the proof, but basically if you have one thing to remember is that when you have a Mercer kernel, you can extend the technique of diagonalizing a matrix that worked for a finite space. All right, so let's try to, you know, go through all the technical details. Uh, first, let me mention or hopefully remind you or at least tell you uh, a few words that we will use. Uh, of course, if you're not comfortable with all these concepts, you should maybe read a bit about functional analysis. Uh, but there is nothing uh, complicated here. My goal is mostly to tell you that even though we use words that you may not be familiar with, they just correspond to extensions uh, of well-known facts for matrices to the case where the matrix is infinite dimensional. All right, so so uh, we start with a Hilbert space, which uh, for matrices would be R to the N, so it would be finite dimensional, but in general, it can be infinite dimensional. Then a linear operator is just a continuous linear function from edge to itself. So if it was a finite space, it would be a linear function. Uh, remember that uh, a linear function from Rn to itself is encoded in a matrix. So this will be the link between the matrix and uh, our linear operator is that we see the matrix as a linear function. So if H is infinite, it's just a linear function over a Hebert space. Uh, when you have a, a linear operator, we say that it's compact. So this thing is specific to operator because all matrices are compact in finite dimension. Uh, but in infinite dimension, we say that it's uh, the operator is compact if uh, and only if for any bounded sequences, so Fn uh, in capital H, when you look at their images, uh, it's also uh, compact in the sense that it has a subsequence that converges. Two more words, we say that an operator is self-adjoint if it holds that F inner product Lg is equal to Lg inner, sorry, Lf inner product G. This is the equivalent uh, of saying that the, if it was a matrix, that it was the, the matrix is symmetric, right? Because if you have a matrix, then F is a vector, G is a vector, LG would be the, 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 the L would be a matrix, so LG would be the image of, uh, of G, and, and the inner product would be F transpose LG for F inner product LG. So the equation here just says that L would be a symmetric matrix, but for operator, we call that self adjoint. Finally, we say that an operator is positive, just like a matrix is you know, positive semi-definite. Here for operator, we say that the operator is positive if it's self-adjoint or symmetric, and if for any f, we have f inner product Lf non-negative. All right, so with these definitions in mind, let's define a bit more specifically what would be the equivalent of uh, the, the matrix uh, when we have an infinite space. And so remember that if we see the matrix as just a linear function that transforms a vector to another vector when the space is finite, then here the equivalent is an operator that transforms a function to uh, into another function, right? And so here uh, we define naturally, uh, so given, um, given a kernel, K, 
um, with, with the, which, I mean, k can be any function that takes two inputs, so k of xt gives a, a real number, we associate the linear function lk as, fun as, as follows. We define lk of f at a point x as the integral of k of xt f of t. And of course, because we have an integral, it has to be according to a measure. So here we take a new, a measure, and, and therefore we need this space capital X to be a measurable space. Okay, uh, so you know, to restate the, the construction of this operator, if we take any measure on X, so it's a borrowed measure, meaning it's a measure associated with the metric of X, the natural metric, uh, and if we call L2 nu of x the Hilbert space of squared inter integrable function of x, then we define the operator Lk, which is an operator from L2 to L2 uh, using the equation of convolution. And the important lemma, once we define that, is that if k is a Mercer kernel, then this operator Lk is compact, bounded, linear, self-adjoint, and positive. Okay, so that's a lot of properties. Most of them you will see are not very complicated to prove, but basically it shows that the fact that K is a Mercer kernel uh, gives to LK many properties that, that are similar to the symmetric and positive semi-definite matrix that we would have if the space capital H was finite uh, dimensional. All right, so uh, let's go through you know, proving all these uh, properties. Uh, and hopefully you will see there is nothing hidden. There is nothing very complicated there. It's just a bit technical. So the first property is that is LK indeed a, a linear operator from L2 to L2? So here I must say, I will be a bit, not sloppy, but um, use a, a slight abuse of notation because remember that uh, L2 is not a space of function, it's a space of equivalence classes of function. And here, uh, LK of X is defined, um, so LK of F is defined for any X, it's defined as a function. So when we say that LKF is in L2, what we mean is that LKF as a function is square integrable, and therefore, we will see in fact that it's a continuous function, and therefore it, it can be, um, it's also an element of L2 in the sense that its equivalence class is in L2. Okay, so let's sh uh, let's show that uh, the function LK that we define with the integral is indeed a function which is continuous, continuous as a function of x. So just to prove the continuity, we take two points x1 and x2, and we will try to show that um, the difference LKF of x1 minus LKF of x2 goes to zero. Uh, when um, when x1 goes to x2. For that, we just uh, take the definition. So the difference between LKF of x1 and LKF of x2 is equal to the integral of the difference between k of x1 t minus k of x2 t times f of t d nu t. Nothing complicated. Now this is, I'm sorry, uh, absolute value is missing in the second line, but this is the absolute value of the inner product in L2 between the function kx1 minus kx2 and the function f. Remember that kx1 is the function that to any number t, t associates k of x1 t. Okay, now we are in the in the Hilbert space L2, so we can use Cauchy-Schwarz inequalities, um, which tells us that the inner product, uh, the absolute value of the inner product is, is smaller than the product of the norms. So we have on the one hand, the norm of kx1 minus kx2, and on the other hand, the norm of f in L2. And now we need to think about this norm of kx1 minus kx2, and this is what should get small. Um, and, and this, you know, if we write it as the integral of kx1 minus kx2 of t uh, square, uh, this is upper bounded by the maximum over t of this function, kx1 of t minus kx2 of t, times, um, the square root of, of the norm of, uh, of x. All right, so uh, now we use the fact that k is a Mercer kernel. So because it's a Mercer kernel, it's continuous. Um, and therefore, because the space is compact, in fact, it's uniformly continuous. So the maximum in t of k of x1 t minus k of x2 t converges to zero uh, 
when x1 converges to x2. All right, so this shows that LK of f is a continuous function, and in particular, because it's continuous over a compact space, uh, it's in L2. Okay, so this shows that uh, L2, so the operator LK maps L2 to L2, but in fact that it maps L2 to the set of continuous functions, and then the continuous function can be seen as an element of L2. Second point, um, it's a linear operator, so linearity is obvious, right? If I come back to the definition of L, you see that if you take, instead of F, you take F1 plus F2, then because the integral is linear, you obtain LK F1 plus LK F2, it's linear. For the continuity, remember that we talk of a linear operator from L2 to itself, so to prove the continuity of the operator, we need to have an upper bound that, like the one at the bottom of this die, which tells us that the norm of the image, so the norm of LKF in L2, is smaller than a constant times the norm of F in L2. This is, um, this is what characterizes a, a continuous linear operator. So how do we get, how do we get this upper bound? Um, we get it by starting by the definition LKF of X at a point X is equal to the integral of K of X T F of T D nu of T. Uh, in absolute value, and then we need to up upon that and try to to have the the norm of f uh, extracted from that. So we use exactly the same upper bound as in the previous slide using Cauchy Schwarz, um, and and this time there is no k x one minus k x two; it's just the, the k of x t to get that this integral is upper bounded by the square root of nu of x times the maximum in t of k of x t times the norm of f in L two. All right, now the maximum in T of K of X T is, um, is upper bounded by a number that we call CK, which is such the maximum over all X T of K of X T, which is finite again, because we are on a compact space. Okay, so finally we, we have this upper bound that tells us that LK of F in a point X is bounded by a constant in the namely square root of nu of X times CK multiply by the norm of f in L2. The last thing we have to do is to obtain an upper bound uh, of the L2 norm of LK of f um, from this upper bound we have on the pointwise value. And so to get that, we just uh, easily write the L2 norm of LK f as the square root of the integral of LK f of t squared, d nu of t. Then we just upper bound uh, LKF of T by uh, the, the upper band we just had. So we get nu of X times CK squared times uh, uh, L2 norm of F squared. Uh, these are all uh, constants that come outside of the square root. Uh, and we have a square root of uh, nu of X that comes out from the integral. So we have two square roots of nu of X, which together give nu of X. Uh, and we get CK times norm of F L2. Right, so finally, we have uh, the important thing here is to get this upper bound. LKF norm is smaller than a constant times F norm, uh, which uh, allows us to conclude that LK is a continuous linear operator from L2 to itself. All right, so the third um, element we wanted to show is that uh, LK is compact. Uh, it's a bit technical, so I will just go quickly through it. You can go through the size, but basically to show compactness of a space, um, of a set of function, we use a theorem called Ascoli theorem. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. If you don't, uh, trust me, it, it's correct, although you can check on Wikipedia uh, on the web. Uh, but it's a criteria that tells us that for uh, a set of continuous function to be relatively compact, in the sense that the closure of the set of functions is compact, uh, we, this set of functions should be uniformly bounded and equicontinuous, where equicontinuity is written in this uh, slide here. So maybe I'll, I'll let you study the slide by yourself. Uh, but basically here, this is what we use in order to, to show the compactness of LK. Because remember that to show that LK is compact, we need to start from a, sp a set of, you know, any sequence of functions Fn, which are bounded. We need to show that when we take their images, we can extract a extract a subsequence of LKFN that converges. And to do that, we just use Ascoli theorem to show that the set 
LK of Fn when n is an integer uh, is uniformly bounded and equicontinuous. And therefore, we can conclude that we can extract a subsequence that converges. Um, the, the boundedness is quite easy because we, we can bound LK of F in, 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 in supremum norms. So the infinite norm is the supremum of LK Fn of X. We can upper-bound it by a constant uh, using the, what we did before. And the equicontinuity is uh, easy as well, right? So I'll keep, uh, I, I'll go a bit fast here. Uh, but using Ascoli theorem, we can conclude that LK of Fn is um, relatively compact, and therefore we can extract a subsequence that converges. OK, so we have a compact linear operator. In addition, we need to show that it's self-adjoint and positive. So self-adjoint, remember, it's a bit like a uh, matrix being symmetric. We just obtain it uh, by um, expanding the inner product F uh, and LG in L2 as the integral of F of X, LG of X, uh, DX. Then we expand LG as the convolution with K. And then we can use Fubini's theorem to invert the integrals uh, and write it as LG of F times LL2. Right, and we can use Fubini because on a compact space, uh, you know, a K is upper bounded and the two functions uh, are uh, squared integrable. All right, finally, the positiveness is uh, we need to, for, so to show that LK is positive, we need to show that when we take F in our product LF, we get a non negative number. So F in our product LF is a doubled integral of F of TF of X times K of XT. Uh, over dx and dt. Um, to show that it's, uh, that, you know, there are different ways to, to prove that it's non-negative, but maybe one of them is, is to use the fact that uh, we can approximate uh, this, um, this Lebesgue integral by, um, by a sum uh, of finite points. You know, we can choose um, a set of points xi, x, uh, x1 to xn uh, that grows to infinity such that the integral is approximated by pointwise um, uh, integrals. Uh, and, and because, and so here we use specifically the fact that k is supposed to be a positive definite function. This is, you know, Mercer kernel is a positive definite function to show that uh, when you have a finite set of points, the double sum of k of xi f xj times f of xi times f of xj is non negative. And therefore, when you take the limit to get an integral, you remain non-negative. All right, so we have all the, the important things. So this, uh, um, this operator LK, which plays the role of some infinite dimensional matrix, is therefore like a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. And so we want to diagonalize it uh, with non-negative eigenvalues. And this is where the famous spectral theorem in functional analysis allows us to conclude. Uh, so here is a, you know, the statement of the spectral theorem. Again, some of you may know it. Uh, if you don't know it, you, you can check it uh, on the web or on, on any uh, course on functional analysis. But basically, the spectral theorem tells you that if you have a compact linear operator, um, then uh, there is, uh, in the Hilbert space or which is, is, it is defined, a complete orthonormal system of eigenvectors. So sometimes you call that eigenfunctions because you know vectors are finite dimensional and functions are the equivalent if the space is continuous. Uh, the, so it's just like saying that you know matrix can be diagonalized over the complex numbers. Then, if the operator is self-adjoint, the eigenvalues are real. So it's just like when you have a matrix, you know that if the matrix is symmetric, then it has real eigenvalues. We here we have the same for compact operators. Uh, and in addition, if the operator is positive, then the eigenvalues are non-negative. So we can apply this theorem to LK. And so if we apply it to LK, it tells us that there exists a complete orthonormal system of L2, because LK was defined from L2 of new to itself. So there is you know, a set of L2 functions, so or equivalence classes of function, uh, 
which we call Psi1, Psi2, etc., uh, associated to eigenvalues, lambda k, which are non-negative eigenvalues, real, uh, real non-negative, uh, that uh, diagonal, so that 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 form a set of uh, eigenvalue eigenvector pairs. All right. Uh, a quick comment here is that remember that here we work in L two, so the psi one, psi two are elements of L two, which are classes of of functions equal almost everywhere. Um, but here, because the psi are uh, eigenfunctions of L k. In particular, we can write the, the equation on this side, which is that psi k is equal to one over lambda k, at least for the strictly positive lambda k, times L k psi k. And remember that we showed earlier that L k of a function, of any function, is a continuous function, right? So it's, an, it's in L2, but in the equivalence class that it defines, there is at least one continuous function, which is representative. So we can, say that psi k, in fact, which is an element of L2, corresponds to a class of functions with, in which there is a continuous function. So we can, you know, with some abuse of language, say that psi k is a continuous function if we take for psi k the function equal to 1 over under k times L k psi k. All right, so Let's now come back to Mercer theorem and a formal uh, statement and proof later. Um, based on what we did, uh, Mercer theorem tells us that if we have you know, compact metric space, if we have any new uh, measure, which has to be non-degenerate, non we will see why. So non-degenerate just means that uh, it's strictly positive on any open set. New of U is strictly positive for any uh, subset with non-empty open. Um, so this is the new, and if we have a continuous positive definite kernel, so this means that we have a Mercer kernel, then if we define the eigenvalues as lambda 1, lambda 2, etc., and corresponding eigenfunctions psi 1, psi 2, so these are the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the operator LK, then all functions psi k are continuous, we just saw it, and importantly, for any two numbers xt, we can write that the number k of xt is the sum for k equal 1 to infinity, so it's a limit, of lambda k times psi k of x times psi k of t. And the convergence, in fact, is absolute uh, for each xt in x and uniform on x times x. All right, so what do we need to prove here? We have already proved that uh, you know there exist eigenvalues, eigenfunctions in LK. Now what we need is to relate them to the value K of XT. So the proof, you know, again requires some technical steps um, in order to relate, you know, to 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 be able to write K of XT as the at the limit of a, of a sum. Um, and, and so let's do it, you know, in basically five uh, five steps. So the first step is, we, let us first show that for any k, so for any um, index k such that the eigenvalue lambda k is strictly positive, then psi k that we defined uh, earlier, so as the eigenfunction of LK, is in fact in the RKHS of k. Um, you know, you may remember that I said that Mercer proved this uh, before, about 40 years before RKHS were introduced, so obviously did not use this exact proof. Here we use this proof using the, the concept of RKHS to shorten a bit the proof. Right, so we, we know that RKHS exists, and so we let's first start by showing that the eigenfunctions of LK, of the operator LK, are in the RKHS. Uh, to prove that, we again come back from the definition of psi k, and we know that for any point x, psi k of x is 1 over lambda k times L k psi k of x. Careful, there is a small k for the index and a big k for the kernel in L k. Now we can uh, develop this as 1 over lambda k times the integral of k of x t psi k of t d nu of t. And so here, Again, we use the fact that the integral is, uh, as a value, uh, can always be written as the limit of a sum. Uh, 
uh, where, where you sample xi according to the measure nu i, uh, sorry, d nu. And so this is a limit of, uh, you have a normalizing factor uh, nu of x, which is the volume of the total space, times one over n, sum of for i equal one to n, k of x ti, psi k of ti. Okay. Um, and, and of course, this is for a set ti well chosen so that the sum approximates the integral. Now, what's important is that here you see that for any, if you, before taking the limit for any fixed n, the function that uh, in x, which is the sum of k of x ti psi k of ti, uh, is in the RKHS because these are the functions k ti, right? This can be written as the sum of k ti of x times a number psi k of ti. So each of these elements in the sum is in the RKHS, and therefore the sum is in the RKHS, and the limit, the pointwise limit, remains in the RKHS. Okay, so psi k is in the RKHS. Second thing, um, not only are there in the RKHS, but up to a normalization. So if you multiply each psi k by square root of lambda k, and remember lambda k is the eigenvalue of the operator lk, uh, then the, the set of square root of lambda k psi k, which is a set of, of functions, is an orthonormal, orthonormal system of capital H, meaning that each psi k has a norm, so each square root of lambda k psi k has a norm equal to one. And if you take two of them with different indices, they are orthogonal to each other. Right, the proof is um, is just obtained by computing for any i and j. You compute the inner product in capital H, so in the RKHS of square root of lambda a psi i and square root of lambda j psi j. Um, to to compute this inner product, you expand one of them. So the first one you write psi i as one over lambda i times the integral for uh, the integral of k t psi i of t d nu t, right? We use the fact that uh, uh, we fix t here. Uh, in a product, so sorry, I see there is a, uh, an extra psi i here. It's not needed. So it's in a product, uh, square root of lambda j psi j. All right, so we have an inner product of an integral. Um, this, this can be exchanged because uh, the integral is linear. So this is equal to, you have square root of lambda j divided by square root of lambda i times the integral of kt inner product psi j, right? Uh, then uh, uh, times psi i of t d nu of t. Okay, now we use the standard property of RKHS that kt inner product psi j is equal to psi j of t. So this is equal uh, up to the square root at the beginning to integral of psi j of t, psi i of t, d nu of t. And so this is exactly the inner product in L2 between psi i and psi j. And because the psi are uh, eigenfunctions of the operator Lk, they are orthogonal to each other. So this is equal to zero if i is different from j. And if i is equal to j, then the inner product in L2 is equal to one and the square root of lambda j divided by lambda i is equal to one because lambda i equals lambda j when i equals j. And therefore we get that uh, the, uh, the inner product in capital H is exactly equal to uh, Dirac uh, ij, meaning that uh, the functions are from an orthogonal, orthonormal system. All right, so using this property, now we uh, make one more step towards proving Mercer theorem by showing that when you fix any x, then the sum of lambda k psi k of x square is bounded by a constant. And, and the constant ck is something we defined earlier. Ck is the maximum value uh, of, of the kernel. So it's the max over x and t of k of x t. How do we get that? Um, well, we just start by observing that, you know, kx, so when you fix x, kx is in the RKHS, and it's not, so the square norm of kx in the RKHS is equal to k of xx, as, as always, and therefore is bounded by ck, okay? Uh, 
Now we use this bound and starting from, from the right. So we write CK, which is larger than the square, uh, the square norm of KX uh, in the RKHS. And now we use what we had in the previous slide, which is that the sum, you know, the set of square root of lambda k psi k is an orthonormal system of the RKHS. So this means that if we project kx into uh, all these, uh, you know, all these unit vectors which are uh, orthogonal to each other, uh, then the norm of kx is at least equal to the sum of of the norm of the projections. Equal. We knew that the psi k times square root of lambda k form a basis, but this we don't know. We just know that they form an orthonormal system, right? So there may be some subspace that they do not fill. But here we just need a, a lower bound. So the norm of kx square is larger than the sum over k such that lambda k is strictly positive. This is what we want of kx in a product, the unit vector square root of lambda k psi k squared. All right, now we recognize here that we have a square root of lambda k that goes outside of the inner product. And because there is a square, you obtain lambda k. And then in the, in the inner product, we have kx inner product psi k. And because we're in the RKHS, this is equal to psi k of x, right? So we get psi k of x square because we have a square uh, in the bracket. And so this gives us what we wanted, namely that uh, the sum uh, over the indices with strictly positive eigenvalues of lambda k psi k of x square is always upper bounded by ck, a fixed number. So we are almost there. Um, now we need to show that when you fix x and you look at the function that t associate the sum of i, the sum over i of lambda i psi a of x psi a of t, so this is a function of t, right? Then this function um, converges. So when you know when you make the sum for i equal one to n, this converges uniformly to a continuous function of t that we will call gx. Um, indeed, in order to to show the convergence, you know we we do the we will show that uh, we have a Cauchy a Cauchy uh, sequence. So we do the sum for i equal m to m plus l of this function we're interested in. So lambda i times psi i x psi i t. Here we use Cauchy Schwarz uh, inequality over just a sum of n terms. So this is upper bounded by uh, the sum of lambda i psi x square square root multiplied by the square root of the sum of lambda i, sorry, uh, this should be, yeah, lambda i psi i of t square. So we have x in the first uh, square root and t in the second square root. Now we use what, what we had in the previous slide just for x. Uh, to notice that the, the sum for i equal m to m plus l of lambda i psi x square is smaller than the sum uh, for any i of this same thing, which was, if I come back to the previous slide, smaller than ck. Notice that this, when lambda for the uh, for the elements where lambda i is equal to zero, they don't contribute to the sum. Okay, so so this gives us the upper bound. Uh, uh, where we have ck times the sum for i equal m to m plus l of lambda i psi i of x square, square root of all that. And so this thing, you know, when you have, um, uh, so sorry, the, the ck was used to upbound the, the, the part with a t, right? And, and we keep the part with an x as, as it is. Now this thing, when, uh, when m tends to infinity, m and l tend to, tend to infinity, this converges to zero uniformly. Um, and so this thing goes to zero uniformly in t because here we have no dependency in t at the end, right? So for any t, you know, if, if you if you rewrite the convergence to zero with epsilon, delta, et cetera, then uh, you can get, for any epsilon, you can get the same, um, the same uh, uh, numbers, uh, so, so that this uh, this big sum is smaller than epsilon for all t, right? So we have uniform convergence in t, uh, and therefore uh, this uh, 
you know, the function that to t associate the sum of lambda i psi of x by of t is uniformly Cauchy. Uh, it's continuous because for any, um, you know, for any finite uh, value of the sum, we have a continuous function. And therefore, uh, we have uh, convergence, uh, we have uniform convergence to a continuous function gx. All right, so now we have gx, and the final thing that we need to show is that gx is in fact equal to kx, because we would like, you see, to write that uh, the sum uh, of lambda i psi of x by of t should be equal to k of x t. This is what we want. Now, what we have shown already is that uh, in as a function, uh, we, we have a function gx that is the limit, uh, which is a continuous function, that is the limit of this sum. Uh, this, uh, Right, so uh, so now we need to work in L2, and we will show that kx is equal to gx in L2. Remember that L2 are equivalent classes of functions, so you can have two functions which are different, potentially different uh, at some value, but which are the same in L2. So to compare kx in gx, what we what we do is we start from kx. We know that kx is in L2. So we can exp we can uh, remember that the psi k they form an orthonorm orthonormal basis of L two, so we can expand k x over this orthonormal basis and write that k x is the sum of k x in a product psi k times psi k. This is all seen as functions in L two. Now k x in a product psi k in L two is exactly equal to L psi k of x. Right. This is uh, if you if you write the inner product in L2, you recover the definition of the operator L, and therefore because L psi k, uh, so before because psi k is an eigenfunction of L, this is equal to lambda k times psi k of x, and and all this multiplied by psi k. All right, and so the, here we have a sum, and, and because we have a sum, and you see that only the, the non-zero lambda k contribute to the sum, we can restrict the sum to the sum for the k such that lambda k is strictly positive of lambda k psi k of x time, times psi k. Okay, so this shows us that in fact in L2, we have exactly the same definition for kx and for gx. It was the same, the sum of lambda i psi of x psi of t. Right, so this shows us that in fact in L2 they are the same the same function. We have kx, which is defined um, as a function in L2, is equal to kx, which is defined as a continuous function. Now we know that uh, by assumption kx is a continuous function, and we have seen that gx is also a continuous function. So since new is supposed to, to be non-degenerate, remember that non-degenerate just means that it's it's a measure that, that has some weight everywhere. So new of u is strictly positive as soon as u is, is non-empty. Uh, then the only possibility for two functions, two continuous functions to be equal in L2 is that they are equal, right? So this means that kx and gx are, are in fact uh, the same function as seen as a continuous function. And therefore, that for any t, kx of t, which is equal to k of x t, is equal to this limit, uh, so this infinite sum, the sum of lambda i, psi i of x, psi i of t. And the convergence is uniform because k is continuous. All right, so this concludes the, the proof. You see, it was a bit technical to have all the details correct, but this shows us that the, the value k of xt, if I come back to the statement, we finally have that k of xt as a number is equal to the limit of a, of a function, um, you know, lambda k times of a, of a series. So the sum of lambda k, psi k of x, psi k of t. Now, from this, we easily conclude, uh, you know, what I started from, which was to say that uh, for Mercer kernels, we can uh, show directly that they can be written as inner product without going through the notion of RKHS. So to get that, you know, it's quite immediate now that we have this characterization that k of xt is the sum of lambda i psi of x psi of t. We basically define a mapping that to any x associate an infinite dimensional, you know, sequence of numbers.
each of them being square root of lambda k times psi k of x. And we immediately get that the inner product between psi, sorry, phi of x and phi of t would be the sum of lambda k times psi k of x times psi k of t, which is equal to k of x t. Right, so k of x t can be written as some inner product. Um, there is a small technicality to check that we are indeed in L2 here because uh, the sum of lambda k psi k of x, psi k of x square is finite. Uh, and in addition, we see that phi is a continuous mapping. Either you can see because the psi k are continuous, or uh, you can directly, you know, um, measure the distance between psi, a, psi of x and psi of t in L2 uh, using the kernel function, and this is a continuous function. All right. So this was a bit, uh, you know, a bit technically involved. Uh, but this shows that uh, when you have a Mercer kernel, so again, it's just a positive definite kernel, which is continuous and defined over a compact uh, uh, space, uh, then it can be uh, written as an inner product uh, using, and, and for that, so we use the particular eigen system, lambda k and psi k, uh, and something that, you know, is a bit strange here, um, and we will clarify it uh, a bit later, is that you see that the set of lambda k and psi k depends on the choice of the function nu. Um, and and so it seems that if you if you know if you take two different nu's, so you have a space uh, x and you have two measures, one could be a Gaussian measure, one could be a uniform measure, then you get different lambda k's and different psi k's, and therefore you would get a different mapping uh, as inner product because this mapping depends on the measure nu. Right, but all these ones are valid mappings. All right, so um, because it's a bit abstract, let's now work out a couple of examples uh, to clarify um, in you know in practical cases what what are these lambda k's, these psi k, and I will uh, I will mention two examples in fact which are quite classical and which are often used in, you know, in papers about learning theory uh, as, as examples of uh, settings for which we can, um, uh, we can give exact upper bounds on the speed of convergence of the, uh, of the functions that are inferred by regression, for example. So the first example is super simple, is when we take for the unit interval, uh, so for x, the unit interval, so the close interval zero one, so this is, uh, compact bounded subspace of R, and we take the Lebesgue measure on it. And then in that space, we consider a positive definite kernel, K of xt, which is just a function of x minus t, uh, which has to be continuous because we want a, a Mercer kernel. Uh, and we assume in addition, this is a constraint we add to this uh, definition, that it's one periodic, kappa is one periodic, okay? Uh, notice that kappa is also symmetric because, of course, k of xt is equal to k of tx. So the question is, in that setting, can you compute, you know, as a function of, it depends on k, of course, but can you compute the um, the Mercer basis? What is the lambda k? What is uh, the, the psi k? And, and how do you write the, the kernel in terms of lambda k psi k? So if we just try to write down what we have seen, uh, we need to define the operator LK uh, as follows. It would be from L2 of 0, 1 to L2 of 0, 1, so to itself, defined as LK psi of x would be the integral of K of x kappa of x minus t times psi of t dt. Uh, and in, in order to find the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of this operator, we need to solve the equation where this uh, LK psi of x should be equal to lambda psi of x. And the question is, how do you solve that? Here is the answer. I mean, a partial answer, and, and we will work out the detailed answer. Um, then the answer is that there is a basis that probably you, you've seen before, which is just the Fourier basis. So the, you know, the Fourier basis is an orthonormal basis of L2. Uh, when you define it as you first have the constant uh, psi zero of x is a constant equal to one, uh, and then you define the you know odds and even 
eigenfunctions as the sines and cosines. So the square root of two is, is just here for normalizing purpose. And then you take the sine of two pi nx or the cosine of two pi nx as a function of n. Uh, and, this and this defines an orthonormal basis of L2, right? So now on this orthonormal basis, we can consider the expansion of kappa, uh, which is called the Fourier transform of kappa. So we can write kappa as, as a sum of kappa hat, which would be the Fourier coefficients, uh, kappa hat 2n times psi 2n of x. Here I just keep the uh, even indices, so the 2n, like two, four, six, eight, because uh, the odd, uh, so the, the, you know, one, three, five, et cetera, are equal to zero just because kappa is an even function, right? As I said before. Now the theorem or the, the lemma at least uh, is that this function, so the, the eigenfunction, so the Fourier basis uh, form, which is an also normal system of L2, form in fact a, a set of eigenfunctions of lk uh, and, the, and the corresponding eigenvalues are kappa hat 0 for psi 0 and kappa hat 2n over square root of 2 for psi 2n minus 1 and psi 2n. So it's technical uh, but the important message here is that this lemma shows what are the eigen uh, what are the solutions to this equation basically. Right. You have this equation, they depend on kappa, but here we see that the eigenfunctions psi do not depend on kappa because they, they are just the standard for your basis. And the only thing that depends on the choice of the kernels on kappa are the eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues are related to the Fourier transform of kappa. I will not go through, through the details of the proof. Maybe you can check the slides. And anyway, it's just a sketch, but uh, it's just a matter of computing. And for example, if I you know jump to the last one, when you want to show that LK psi 2n is is equal to lambda something type psi 2n, you just compute it. Um, and you know, quite standard computation gives you the answer. So just I think it's a good exercise by yourself to try to reproduce this computation and, and fill out the details here. All right, so um as, as a remark, we know that Mercer theorem is correct because we have proved it. But here, once you see uh, the psi k, well, you know that they are uh, continuous. Uh, and the expansion, uh, the fact that k of xt is the sum of lambda k times psi uh, k of x times psi k of k can be also recovered immediately in this case because we use the sine and cosine functions. Right? So. Uh, just a sanity check that a Mercer theorem in this case uh, can be um, uh, proven by hand. All right, so so let's see, uh, you know, more concretely what what are the kernels that we study in this situation. So, for example, remember that here I said that once you choose a kernel as a, as you know through the kappa, so kappa was the kappa of x minus t was k of x t, then you recover. Um, eigenfunctions, which are the, the Fourier basis, and the eigenvalues depend on, on the Fourier transform kappa hat. So in order to, we will see, you know, uh, we, we will see in the next um, uh, session that the eigenvalues are important. So here we can start by defining eigenvalues and see what kernel come out for that. So for example, here, let's consider the case where we want to impose that the eigen, um, the eigenvalues related to the kappa hat are as follows. For kappa hat of zero, we set zero. And for kappa hat of 2n, uh, because remember that uh, this is what was important to define the eigenvalues, we had kappa hat 2n, which was uh, the eigenvalue for the, for the eigenfunctions. We want to have a, what's called a polynomial decay. So we define it as n to the power minus two beta for any beta, okay? Uh, then, depending on the choice of beta, we will obtain different kernels that have different uh, decay of eigenvalues. Then, in this case, it's possible to compute exactly um, uh, exactly the, the kernel, and the kernel k of xt corresponding to these eigenvalues uh, is maybe not very intuitive, but at least there is a closed form solution uh, given in red here is one divided by the uh, factorial two beta.
So sorry, I, I didn't mention that here. We assume that beta is, an, is a strictly positive integer. So one divided by two b factorial times the Bernoulli polynomial two beta of x minus t minus inter, integer value of x minus t, right? And the Bernoulli polynomial, so I will not uh, give all the details. There is a link to a Wikipedia page here, but it's just a set of polynomials uh, with you know one of the sub coefficients. So the message here, you don't have to remember the, the details, but the message here is that you see that starting from the eigenvalues, and this can be, you know, the eigenvalues can be useful to have in mind, we will see why later. Then we can start from the eigenvalues to define the kappa hat. And from this kappa hat, we obtain a formula for a positive definite kernel k of xt, right? Okay, another example, if we, you know, if you want to have eigenvalues that go to zero much faster, uh, for example, what's called exponential decay are eigenvalues that go to zero as exponential minus rho n. Uh, then we also uh, can derive formulas. Uh, so in this case, you know, for if you fix rho and you want the eigenvalues kappa hat to decay as exponential minus rho, rho n, then the corresponding k of xt is given by this uh, ugly formula, which is correct. Um, I think it's a good exercise to uh, to to show it, you know, it's just uh, recovering a function for its Fourier coefficient. There is nothing very complicated. And if you want to check that, uh, so I encourage you to try to work out the details. Uh, and if you want to check that you're correct, you can look at uh, the paper by Francis Back, uh, given in reference, uh, page 21. All right, um, very quickly, this is, um, the second example is a generalization of the interval zero one to higher dimension, and here we constrain uh, we constrain ourselves to be uh, on the sphere. So if it was in one D, it would be the circle in two D, it would be the, the sphere you see here, and etc. Uh, so we consider the sphere, and here we'll uh, speed up a bit because there's also lots of information, but um, nothing to remember, uh, in fact. But the question is, suppose you consider the data x to be the sphere. So this is a, a well-defined compact metric space uh, instead of RD. If we endow it with the Lebesgue measure, so we have a space and a measure new on it, then how can we find, again, the eigenvalues, eigenfunctions of the LK operator? Um, and for that, we will, you know, we will again try to solve the, the equation that defines the eigenvalues as LK of, of psi, so the, in this case, it would be the integral over the sphere of the kernel between K of X T uh, times psi of T D nu of T. This should be equal to lambda times psi of X, okay? Um, in order to solve that, we will focus just on a particular set of kernels, which are functions of the inner product, like K of X T is a function of X transpose T, inner product between X and T. There could be, you know, other choices, but this is just uh, an example to show you, in this case, uh, that we know exactly what are the eigenfunctions that uh, appear in Mercer's theorem. So the answer to that, and again, I encourage you to um, to look uh, at the details. I will maybe skip the definition, uh, but the answer to that is that we know. So if we know how to solve the equation again uh, here that defines the, the, the eigenfunctions and the eigenvectors uh, for such kernels on the sphere. And the answer is given by the funk enke theorem. Again, check on, on Wikipedia or on some books. That, that shows us that um, we have an orthonormal basis of L2, just like you know in the previous example, we had a Fourier basis. So here we have another basis of L2 which also solves the equation in the sense that here the functions are yk of t, okay? And we have that the integral of phi of x transpose t, so this is the kernel between x and t, times the function yk of t, d nu of t, is equal to lambda k, where lambda is given by the next equation, times yk of x. So the question is, I didn't tell you yet, what, what are those yk? Are they the Fourier basis? Well, they are basically a bit like the Fourier basis. They are called the spherical harmonics on the sphere. This is a slide I just skipped. Uh, 
a spherical harmonic is just on the sphere um, uh, a homogeneous harmonics, mean, meaning a polynomial, homogeneous polynomial of degree k whose Laplacian vanishes uh, on the sphere. So these are things that maybe you have seen in uh, quantum chemistry, you know, to study the the wave functions of the electrons, etc. These are well understood uh, concepts uh, that defines a bit like the Fourier basis on the sphere. And so this theorem tells us that these functions for any phi, so for any function, for any kernel uh, that is a function phi of the inner product, then these functions, so the, harmon the spherical harmonics, are eigenfunctions of the operator LK. Uh, so as before, the, the eigenfunctions do not depend on the phi, right? But what depends on phi are the eigenvalues. And there is a complicated formula written here. Uh, that gives you lambda k as a function of phi. All right, so um, what we can say here is that, uh, you know, to, to, to sum up, uh, the spherical harmonics form a basis of L2 and they form exactly a basis of eigenfunctions of LK for any kernel K that is a function uh, phi of X transpose T on the sphere. And as I just said, I repeat, the eigenfunctions, they do not depend on phi. So for any phi, they will be the same eigenfunctions. The only thing that differs are the eigenvalues, and the eigenvalues depend on phi, obviously. Uh, if you want, you know, to spend a bit, um, to make sure you've understood, maybe you can try to solve, to write down by, by hand. Uh, one example, which is if you consider the kernel k of xt is equal to 1 plus x transpose t squared just uh, uh, on 2D, so meaning on the circle, uh, then you can just use explicitly this formula. So check you know, what it gives um, in terms of Legendre polynomial. I mean, you can use this formula here, uh, the, 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 the Rodriguez rule that gives you lambda k as a function of phi. So you can replace phi by phi of t equals 1 plus t squared obtain that and then you will get three non-zero eigenvalues with different multiplicities the corresponding eigenfunctions so these are the harmonics in this case there are just uh, five different harmonics uh, that say you roll here uh, and the corresponding feature map is just so feature map remember is once you have the eigenfunctions of the uh, of the of lk you need to multiply them by the square root of lambda k to obtain um, uh, the 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 feature map, right? Because the the kernel was the sum of lambda k, psi k of x, psi k of t. So the the mapping was square root of lambda k times psi k of t. So here, if we multiply the lambda zero, lambda one, lambda two, so the square root of these lambdas by the corresponding eigenfunctions of k, we obtain the mapping. Uh, the, the feature, the Mercer feature map, which is the following. For example, the first one would be square root of 3 pi, which is square root of lambda 0, times 1 over square root of 2 pi, which is the eigenfunction of LK. Uh, the square root of pi cancels, and we obtain square root of 3 divided by 2. And you do the same for the other ones, and you get a, 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 a vector representation of any point x. And of course, it's easy to, to see that when you make phi of x transpose phi of t, so if everything is correct, we should recover k of xt, because this is uh, what Mercer kernels told us. And here, obviously, you can check it directly using the property that x and t are on the sphere. All right. So. Uh, to finish this, um, this part on, on Mercer kernels, we'll try now to answer uh, a question, which is to make the link between what we have seen. So here we have, uh, st you know, starting from a Mercer kernel, we have, we have shown that it can be written as an inner product using these psi, which are the eigenfunctions, and, and the lambda k, which are the eigenvalues of one operator. But we didn't make the link yet with the RKHS. Except at some point we said that the psi k, you know, up to normalization are in the RKHS and even form an orthonormal system. 
All right, so here now we will finally uh, uh, conclude this part by showing uh, exactly what is the RKHS of Mercer kernels and using the using the psi and, and the lambdas. All right, so this is what we have seen so far. So I, I will just quickly repeat. We have we have said that if we have a Mercer kernel, then we can define the operator LK as a convolution of K of, a, of K and F. Then this operator in L2 has eigenvalues, which are the lambda Ks, and eigenfunctions, which are, which are the psi Ks. And we have seen, this was method theorem, that K of X, Y uh, can be written as phi of x times phi of y, where phi of x is the vector made of the square root of lambda k, psi k of x, when k is an integer. Okay, so what we're gonna prove now is that the RKHS of the kernel can also be defined in terms of the eigenfunctions psi and eigenvectors lambda k. And in fact, the, the following theorem holds it says that if we, so if you assume to, for simplicity that all eigenvalues are positive, otherwise we can just restrict the sum to, to the positive ones, uh, then the RKHS of the kernel is exactly the set of functions which are linear combinations and their limits of the psi i, so things like f is a sum of a i psi i, where the psi i are the eigenfunctions of the operator LK that was used by Mercer, uh, and but the, so this is the set of functions. But the AI uh, have to satisfy the property that the sum of AK squared divided by lambda K has to be finite, and in fact uh, this allows then to you know to define the the norm and the inner product in the RKHS. So for example, the inner product between two functions f and g in the RKHS, which are defined as the sum of a i psi i for f and the sum of a i of sorry uh, b k psi k for g the, then the inner product would be the sum of a k b k divided by lambda k right and so in terms of norm if we just focus on the square norm of f for example it would be the square norm of f is just the sum of a k square divided by lambda k Okay, um, of course we need to prove it. So here it's a statement about the RKHS. So what we need uh, is to first show that the space that we have just defined, so this set of functions is a Hilbert space. So we take these functions and this bracket, we need to show that it's a Hilbert space. And then we need to show that for any X, KX is in that space. And that for any X and F, we have the reproducing property that F of X is equal to F inner product KX. So the fact that it's a Hilbert space is uh, simple because in fact, you know, we know that L2 is a Hilbert space. Psi, so the set of Psi K is a basis of L2. So if we, you know, if we come back to this definition, we see that here we can define this space as the image of L2 according to the function that transforms any functions in L2. So the sum of AI Psi I into the corresponding function where we multiply the coordinate a i by square root of lambda i right so so this you know this mapping is an isomorphism because all the lambda i as are strictly positive it's an isomorphism between l2 and and our space h when we define h uh, like this right uh, isomorphism means that we can show that it's a uh, bijection and also that the inner product so the norm is conserved uh, and therefore it transports the, the structure of a Hilbert space. So the so H is a Hilbert space, just like L2 is a Hilbert space. All right, second thing, uh, uh, you know, it's a Hilbert space, but we need to, to make sure that its elements are function, because remember that an RKHS is a Hilbert space of functions. So here we show that it's a Hilbert space of continuous functions, in fact. Um, and to prove that, we start from an element, the sum of a i psi i, which is uh, in our, you know, space that we define. We say it's a sum of a i psi with a i uh, that satisfies this constraint. So we we have this, and so we can upper bound, you know, if it exists. So we, you know, we already start with an infinite sum, but 
to be extremely uh, rigorous, we should do the sum for i equal 1 to n and then take the limit. But here we directly take the limit if it exists uh, to show that the sum uh, of a i psi of x uh, is, you know, can be upper-bounded using cauchy schwarz by the sum of a i square divided by lambda i, square root of that multiply by the square root of the sum of lambda i psi of x squared. Now, the first one is finite because this is uh, the constraint when you're in h, and this is exactly f bracket f. Um, so because there's a square root, you obtain the, the norm of f uh, in capital H. And the second one will recover by Mercer's theorem that is equal to k of x x square root. And so the second one is upper bounded by a number always the same ck, and here we have a square root. Right, so this, this implies in particular that um, that convergence in, in the norm in H implies uh, uniform convergence because we have the supremum norm, so the infinite norm of F bounded by the norm of F in H by ck. All right, so because we have that, then uh, if we take a function, so if we, if we now have a, you know, a partial sum for i equal one to n of ai psi i, we know that all the psi i are continuous, therefore fn is continuous. They converge in capital H, therefore also in, this con in, you know, in the complete space of continuous functions. This is uh, using what we just showed. Why, right? if we have a sequence of functions that converges in capital H, they also converge uh, in the infinite uh, norm um, uh, space of continuous functions. And because that space is uh, is complete, the space of complete of continuous functions with a uniform norm, we know that they have a continuous limit, which we can call F C. Um, of course, F C is in L two. And we have that uh, the the you know, convergence uh, in the, in the continuous function with the uniform norm implies convergence in L two. So F C has a property that F n minus F C tends to zero in L two. And on the other hand, when you when we look at F minus F n, um, F minus F n in L two is upper bounded in particular by lambda one times f minus fn in h, right? Because we have the, the link between the norm in L2 and, and h, and it goes to zero. Therefore, we have two functions, um, uh, which uh, which are the limit of, of the sequence fn in L2, and therefore they are equal, right? So this shows finally that, you know, the limit uh, of fn in, in uh, L2 is a continuous function uh, fc. So this shows that the capital H is a space of continuous functions, is a Hilbert space of continuous functions. Finally, we need to show that Kx is in H. So Kx, uh, you know, we we can write K of, so for any X, we can define for any I the number Ai by lambda I psi I of X. Uh, if we define this this way, then we can check that when we compute the sum of a i squared divided by lambda i, this would be equal to the sum of, so that would be lambda i squared times psi i squared, but because we define by lambda i, there is no square at lambda anymore. And the sum of lambda i psi of x squared is equal to k of x x, so it's finite. Okay, so the defining a i equals lambda i psi of x is a valid uh, sequence of a i to be in the Hebert space. And therefore, the, the, the function phi x uh, defined by the sum for i equal 1 to infinity of a i psi i is an element of capital H. OK, so we have seen just before that convergence in capital H implies pointwise convergence. Therefore, we can write that for any t, psi x of t is the limit of uh, so, you know, phi x of t by, by definition is the sum of a i psi i of t, uh, which is uh, by definition of a i the sum of lambda i psi i of x psi i of t, and by Mercer theorem, this is equal to k of x t, right? And so, therefore, this shows that in fact phi x is equal to k x, and therefore, because phi x is in capital H, so is k x.
So we have shown that Kx is in capital H. All right, last thing to prove uh, now is for any f and any x, we need to have f of x is equal to the bracket, so the inner product between f and kx. So how do we do that? Well, we take any function f uh, in the space capital H, so something like the sum of ai psi i with the constraint in uh, over ai. Remember that the sum of ai squared divided by lambda i should be finite. Uh, and we have just seen that for kx, so if you fix x, kx can also be written, so this is in the previous slide, can be written as the sum of lambda i psi i of x times psi i. Right? This is what we have here. So let's compute the inner product between f and kx, each of them as an expansion of a psi i, so we can use the definition of the inner product over a capital H uh, as the sum of uh, the coefficient of kx, so this is lambda i psi i of x, times the coefficient of f, which is a i, all this divided by lambda i, right? This is the definition of the inner product in capital H. Now we can compute a bit. We see that we have a lambda i above and below the, the fraction, so we can cancel them, uh, which gives the sum of a i psi i of x, um, i i psi of x and this by definition is exactly equal to f of x so we have well we have correctly the uh, the property that f inner product kx in capital h is equal to f of x which finally concludes the proof okay so it was um, long and technical um, but interestingly, um, let, let me make a, a couple of remarks. So the first remark is remember that the space capital H here uh, is defined in terms of the eigenfunctions of LK. Okay, and, and as I said before, so the lambda K and the psi K. And as I said before, the lambda K and psi K depend on the measure D nu, right? You have a space X, then you say, if I have a measure nu on X, then I can define the eigenvalues, eigenfunctions. Uh, now, on the other hand, we know that the RKHS does not depend on any measure. The RKHS of, uh, of a kernel, when you have a space X and a kernel, you just have one RKHS that is a space of function. So first remark is that even though here we have, you know, here we have a characterization of the RKHS in terms of eigenvalues, eigenfunction, if we, if we decided to choose two measures, like u1 and u2, you would have two equivalent uh, definitions of the same Hilbert space, because this Hilbert space is the RKHS, right? Um, so don't be confused that it's not because psi and lambda are defined and depend on the particular choice of the measure that the space and the inner product here depend, right? They're, they're, they are all, whatever the choice of new, you will get the same RKHS, Simply, you know, Hilbert space can be uh, described in different ways. Uh, second comment is that, as you know, with the couple of examples I gave on the interval on the sphere, you know, there are some domains where uh, where we know very well how to characterize the functions, uh, which are the eigenfunctions of LK, and so Mercer theorem gives sometimes a very concrete way to build the RKHS. Uh, starting from an operator on which we can compute eigenfunctions, and then we define uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the kernel, the eigenvalues, and we obtain uh, the RKHS over the basis of the, of the eigenfunctions. Third comment, which is maybe the most important to remember here, is that um, the psi k, which are the eigenfunctions of the operator, as we have seen, are also uh, eigenfunctions, uh, so uh, form an ortho orthogonal basis in the RKHS. And so when you take two eigenfunctions, uh, they're orthogonal to each other in the RKHS. And importantly, the norm in the RKHS of psi is one over square root of lambda i, right? So this means that if you have a psi with a very small lambda, then it has a large norm in the RKHS. So in other words, the, the RKHS, you can think of it as an ellipsoid uh, in, in, in L2. Uh, 
um, remember that the psi are L2 functions. Uh, and so you're in L2 and the arcade is a subspace of L2. It's an ellipsoid and the axes are given by the functions. So this is a rough summary, um, artistic view of, of what we have here. Imagine here that uh, we have, a, you know, so this, this picture, maybe you should draw it by yourself to convince yourself of, you know, the different things we have. But in red here, we have an example of what could be um, a new measure. So suppose you have some points, um, so some the points X, which are sampled according to an ellipsoid here. Then using new, we can define um, uh, an eigen basis of L2, and this is related, for example, to what we do in PCA. Uh, and here, for example, you have Psi1 and Psi2 in blue, which would be functions, so represent functions, uh, which have uh, a norm equal to, to one in L2. So remember that you know the norm in L2 nu of Psi, so if the data center, for example, would be something like the sum over the, the, the red points of Psi i of x square. And so you see that in directions where the the x are very uh, concentrated, uh, like in in the in the almost horizontal direction, then psi has to take uh, large values very quickly in order for the sum of psi of x i squared to be equal to one. And on the axis where the um, on the orthogonal axis here, where the data are scattered quite far from origin, then psi can be small. But the important thing is that Psi1 and Psi2 would have the same L2 norm in this case. And so what is the RKHS here? Well, uh, the RKHS, uh, as we said, is an ellipsoid in L2. And, and the RKHS has the same, um, you know, Psi1 and Psi2 also form an orthogonal um, basis for the RKHS up to normalization. So once you multiply them by square root of lambda 1. And so in, in green here, you have phi one and phi two defined as the square root of the lambda times the psi, which form an ortho, ortho, uh, you know, orthogonal basis of the RKHS. So maybe you can take time to think about this this thing to 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 have in mind the relationship between L two and HK. All right, so. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll stop here, but just to mention that uh, based on that, we can, for example, conclude that, um, you know, for, for many examples, we can work out very precisely what, what uh, how to characterize the RKHS. So for example, here, we just quickly mentioned uh, one example that we saw earlier, when you take the interval zero one, so the closed interval, we, we show that, uh, we showed before that we can define uh, kernel functions, for example, using the Bernoulli polynomial, remember that k of xt with so the, the red formula here was a kernel over the in, interval 0, 1, such that the eigenvalues over the Fourier basis uh, of, um, of the operator Lk had a polynomial decay. Now it's possible to show, uh, it's quite, quite easy, that uh, using what we just showed, so, using the characterization of the RKHS in terms of lambda and psi, that uh, the RKHS here is exactly made of functions f, such that uh, the sum uh, over the, the, you know, the Fourier elements of the Fourier transform, so f, f, uh, f hat 2n minus 1 plus f hat 2n, so, so the square, the sum of the square. So this, these are the Fourier transforms of f multiplied by n to the power two beta. So this multiplication by n to the power two beta is important. This corresponds exactly, if I come back a bit earlier, um, to, the, to this property, right? When you have f defined over the basis, so here the basis would be the Fourier basis. So you, you can think of any function f, its norm in the RKHS would be, you need to decompose it over the Fourier basis. So psi would be the Fourier basis. AI would be the Fourier transform, so this would be the F hat. And the norm of F would be the sum of F hat squared divided by lambda K, right? And so here, remember that for this particular kernel, so the Psi are the Fourier basis, therefore we have the Fourier transform, this would be the AIs. And the division by lambda K 
uh, is a multiplication by n to the power 2 beta because we have seen that this this kernel here corresponds to the eigenvalues n to the power minus 2 beta right so this is a way to you know to use this characterization uh, of through the Mercer basis in order to characterize the RKHS. And so now, uh, when you look at this, then if you, if you do some, you know, some functional analysis, some Fourier transforms, then you may know that the functions such that the sum of their Fourier transforms, so their Fourier coefficients times n to the power two beta is exactly um, uh, forms a, what's called the subolef space. So these are the functions such that uh, for i equal one to beta minus one, the um, f i is absolutely continuous. And importantly, uh, using Perceval's inequality, we can show that the, this same equation, so the square norm of f, is simply equal to up to normalization to the inter, so the L two norm of the beta uh, derivative of f. There's lots of information in that side, but we just used a sequence of tools that we have built. So the first one is uh, relating a kernel function k to uh, its eigenfunction, eigenvectors uh, in the Mercer, in the Mercer uh, theory. Now, this allows us to characterize the RKHS in terms of Fourier transform of f, and then rephrase the you know, the coefficients or the constraint or the norm using the Fourier transforms in terms of, using Perceval's inequality, in terms of uh, L2 norm of derivatives of F. Right, and so another way to say it is that if you start from the end, if you say, I want to make a, um, an RKHS that penalizes uh, the, 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 the integral from zero to one of the beta derivative of X square, and here we have some specific functions, which are that the functions have to be periodic for, for this to hold here. Uh, then this is the kernel that I need to use. So there is obviously a link with what uh, we discussed with the green functions. Uh, and I think it's good for you to think a bit about what's different, what's similar between the green kernels that we saw last time. Uh, and this example of, uh, of Mercer kernels, uh, and just a hint, um, you know, the, the some of the differences or similarities are in the small constraints like here we constrain f to be uh, periodic uh, which which allows us to use the Fourier transform eigen, um, eigen decomposition here. All right we'll stop here this was a long session uh, with lots of details but um, uh, next time so next time is just a bonus but if you're interested the next section is about how all these can be used to study the theory of, of machine learning and have convergence rates um, for, for example, kernel rich regression uh, and show that you know the kernel rich regression estimator is minimax optimal uh, over uh, various families of functional spaces. Right? But so to do that, and there's lots of literature, lots of research on that, we also use the properties of the eigenfunctions, eigenvectors that we have uh, in different functional spaces. So see you next time.